Thank you, Patrick, and welcome to this month's Connect with BMC Helix ITSM and Remedy webinar. Uh, during the webinar, you're able to ask questions to our panelists, and at the end of the presentation, we also will take live Q&A uh, questions. Uh, this recording, again, will be published within a week of today's live presentation along with the Q&A. And at this time, the database considerations for the Remedy Platform Solution will be presented by Rajiv Patel, and I'll turn it over to him now. Good morning. Good afternoon, folks. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Patrick. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, Connect with BMC Helix ITSM and Remedy. And uh, topic for today's webinar is database considerations. My name is Rajiv Patel, and I'm a lead product developer in BMC. I've been working for BMC for 14 and a half years. And my primary area of expertise is database uh, performance uh, tuning, database performance. Um, I started working with Oracle software, the database software, way back in 1989. I worked for Oracle for about almost nine years, from 1996 to 2005, and I joined BMC in 2005. And when I joined them, I had <clears throat> uh, almost zero knowledge of SQL Server, but over the years, uh, um, given that we have customers on Oracle and SQL Server, I've, I've learned a little bit about SQL Server, and I feel way more confident now. So whatever I've learned, uh, some of the tips, uh, in today's presentation come from the stuff I've learned over the years for both Oracle and SQL Server, uh, especially SQL Server. So let's move ahead. Today's agenda, <clears throat> an overview. There is a, always a caveat emptor <laughs> associated with at least my webinars. There'll be a slide on the architecture overview. We'll cover SQL Server first, followed by Oracle. Um, there will be a slide on references, and then I will turn it over to uh, you folks um, towards the end uh, for a question and answer session, should you have any questions. So over the years, uh, when I first started working for Remedy or for BMC uh, all those years ago, I remember working with a few customers on DB2. I think there were a couple of customers on Sybase, but over the years, um, the customer base has pretty much settled down into two main databases, <clears throat> Oracle and SQL Server. And with SQL Server getting more and more popular uh, of late. And uh, so I've, as I said, today's the webinar will cover Oracle and SQL Server only. A high percentage, and I don't want to put a number on that, a high percentage of performance issues arise in the database and uh, addressing them appropriately and hopefully preemptively can alleviate a uh, pain that users are likely to face when they are going through their use cases, their daily work activities. And uh, the biggest tool um, is SQL tuning. It can help with making use cases run faster and in order to tune SQL statements, it's always a great thing to have execution plans so that we can make educated guesses on how, um, how to go about changing um, either the database or adding appropriate indexes or, or other objects in the database. And um, I've noticed over the years that there are configuration parameters that can sometimes help uh, alleviate these problems. Here is your caveat mTOR. So we, um, BMC and Remedy, so BMC is not in the business of database administration or SQL tuning. Yes, we do write the SQL that goes into your database, but uh, the tuning exercise is pretty much left to the customer uh, DBAs, and, um, and that should be done on an ongoing basis. All the tips offered in this presentation should be thoroughly tested in a non-production environment before implementing them in production. It's likely that an index here or there might help one or two use cases, but you might have a, one or other, one or more use cases that are really important to your business practice that might suffer a lot or a little. So, you know, they need to be tested. Changes need to be tested exhaustively. And each customer site tends to be different. I don't rec recollect ever working with a customer who had never customized or had not customized their remedy application or environment, which means 
on paper, each customer site should be different. Physical hardware is different. You know, um, data volumes are different. Data distributions, um, business practices, which uh, turn into use cases eventually, are different. So basically, the tuning and the, and the, and the ongoing performance tuning maintenance falls on the customer's AR team and the DBAs. This is the slide I was talking about, the architecture overview. So you have your client here right on top. Uh, it could be a laptop, it could be a desktop server, it could be sometimes mobile devices, and they all connect to the mid-tier. Um, the mid-tier basically receives an, uh, a request from the client, uh, processes it, and sends it over to the AR server. The AR server receives it generates the appropriate, um, takes the appropriate action, usually generates, um, you know, runs an API that eventually will generate, uh, the, the engine generates a SQL statement and that goes on to the database server. The database processes it and sends it back in reverse order back to the client. So let's start with the first database uh, of today's presentation, uh, Microsoft SQL Server. So over the years, there, these are some of the parameters, um, SQL Server configuration parameters that we have found to be useful in, in alleviating performance issues. Whether it's Oracle or SQL Server, SQL statements entering the database can be of one of two types loosely. SQL statements that have literal values or SQL statements that are enter the database with variables in place instead of literal values. And by this I mean the simplest statement would be select employee ID from employee master where employee name equals Rajiv. So the Rajiv part is a literal value. Or you could have the same statement represented as select employee ID from employee master where employee name equals and you have a variable there. So <clears throat> what that does is if a SQL comes in with a literal value and everything else about the SQL is the same, so if I were to take that first example I gave you with my name Rajiv, and if I were to replace Rajiv with Greg or Patrick, now you have three different SQL statements as far as the SQL, uh, as far as the SQL optimizer, the optimizer engine and the database is concerned, which would imply, which would necessitate three different memory areas in the database and uh, you know three different uh, memory cursors, and eventually, if you don't have enough resources allocated to your to um, for memory for the database, you could have um, you know bottlenecks as far as memory goes. But if I were to replace the Rajiv or the Gregory or the Patrick with a variable, you now have just a single statement that takes up one memory area, and uh, it makes that single statement shareable. So the parameterization parameter in versions prior to 9x, we were recommending that that parameter be set to forced because in versions 6, 7, and 8 and prior versions, even 5, we were issuing literal statements. Um, about, I said 12, 13 years ago, the decision was made to rewrite Remedy uh, in the AR system um, server in Java. and. Uh, the other, one of the other decisions was made to basically not send literal values to the database. Um, and so we end up replacing literal values with bind variables or variables in our JDBC code. And when the database, is, uh, database encounters a SQL statement, it already comes with a bind variable in place. So for Remedy 9x and later, 18x and 19x, for SQL Server, we recommend that you set this parameter to simple. The other, the other parameter we recommend in our tuning guide uh, is something called read committed snapshot. So basically this parameter determines the behavior of the default read committed isolation level. Um, and so if you do not specify a value for this, if you do not set it to on, then this read committed is applied to all implicit transactions. What it basically means is when it's off, the database uses shared logs to enforce the default isolation level, but if you set it to on, it uses row versioning and snapshot isolation as the default instead of using locks to protect the data. 
So it makes it more scalable. It makes uh, concurrent access a little easier. So over the years, we've rec uh, recommended customers set this particular parameter to on. And um, the BMC tuning guide has um, a little bit more information, or you could head over to Microsoft and, and, and read a little bit more about the recommended snapshot parameter. But um, over the years, we've realized setting it to on has helped our customer base. This parameter and the one on the subsequent slide, these two have helped a lot over the years. Um, basically, this parameter is effective on multi-CPU database servers on a machine that has just one CPU, and I really, really do not recommend you running your database with just a single CPU, but for theoretical purposes, if you have a single CPU, you are not going to be able to run a query in parallel because it's going to run on one CPU, so it can only run as a single thread. So this particular parameter applies to multi-CPU database servers. The default value is zero. So if, if you haven't changed this parameter and your, your database, uh, your SQL Server instance has a value, and by the way, this parameter is set at the instance level. If it has a value of zero, it means that a query which qualifies to be run in parallel will run on all available CPUs. If you intend to make use of parallelism, our recommendation is you set this value to something other than zero to prevent a query that qualifies for parallelism to run, to run on all CPUs and set it to a value between zero and eight. We have over the years realized that setting it to a value higher than eight doesn't gain much, so we recommend a value no higher than eight. And um, obviously, as I said, if it's set to a value of one, um, it, it won't run in parallel. If it's set to a value that's higher than the number of available processors, it's tantamount to basically um, setting it to a value of zero, which means using all, all, all the CPUs that are available. And um, my recommendation, I, I, I actually was involved in a, in a customer case last week where inadvertently they had a process that ran and that had set um, the value of this parameter back to zero. They were running, they had been running with a value of eight. I think it was eight or was it four? I think it was four, I forget, it doesn't matter. It was a number either four or eight. And some process background, some process they had, they didn't know that the process, one of the things it was doing was setting that particular parameter back to the default value. So on Monday morning last Monday, not this Monday, but the Monday before, they woke up to the CPU being pegged at 90, 95, and 100%. And um, after some due diligence from BMC, with BMC support help, they discovered that the value had been set back to zero. And the minute they set it back to four or eight, whatever they're using, the CPU settled down. So one of the recommendations is now and then if you see CPU spikes suddenly happening when they haven't been happening for a long time, um, I would recommend going and looking at this parameter and the parameter on the next slide and making sure that somehow they haven't been changed from the values you've been using for you know, the past month or two months or however long they've been being used. So this parameter works in conjunction with this particular parameter known as the cost threshold for parallelism. Cost, what is cost? Uh, loosely speaking, um, SQL Server, Microsoft documentation states that the cost is a number, it's just a number. In Oracle, um, there are blogs out there, there are people who have come up with the, with, the, with the tip that cost in Oracle corresponds to time because of the way cost is calculated by the Oracle Optimizer engine, but SQL Server and Microsoft insist that cost in Microsoft is a number. Every query that comes into the database is processed, and one of the things that is, the, the, the thing that is done after it passes a semantic and a, and a, and a syntax check is uh, the, the database optimizer engine comes up with a cost for that particular statement. The cost is nothing but a number representing how cheap or how expensive it would be if for that execution plan, to fetch the rows from the database and pass them back to the user. 
And so obviously, uh, higher the cost, the more expensive or the longer it might take for those rows to be uh, sent back to the client. And so um, for, for every statement, as I said, there is a cost. And this cost is calculated, loosely speaking, by gathering from, with the help of, of data from something called uh, database statistics, optimizer statistics, both on Oracle and in SQL Server. It is recommended, highly recommended, I mean, it's imperative that database administrators gather statistics on database objects, tables, indexes, and do that activity as frequently as possible for tables and indexes that are used all the time, um, also known as hot objects, right? Hot tables and hot indexes. So these statistics feed into the optimizer engine's calculation of the cost and the execution plan that has the lowest cost among, amongst all the ones that the optimizer considers is the one that is usually chosen. So the default value for this cost threshold for parallelism is five. And uh, BMC has realized uh, over the years that five is too low a value. And uh, we've been recommending a starting value of 50. And then depending on your business practices and your use cases and your workload, we recommend that you start with this value of 50 and then adjust um, um, you know, with a value higher or lower depending on you know, how your workload has been behaving and how your SQL statements are being run, how your database server is responding to the value of 50 and, uh, and uh, parallelism in play. And so you could adjust higher or lower. So again, going back to parallelism, if you have a multi-CPU machine, you might benefit from having SQL statements run in parallel. We recommend not setting higher uh, a value of parallelism, maximum degree of parallelism higher than eight. But that's obviously assuming you have a machine that has more than eight CPUs. And uh, setting this cost threshold to a value of 50. And um, when you have an execution plan in SQL Server's management studio, if, you're to, if you've turned on parallelism, uh, one of the things you will see is that little, little uh, operator on the right called parallelism. So you see that's, that, that operation in your execution plan. And when you hover your cursor on the select, you will see degree of parallelism there. In this case, it's four. And you'll see something called estimated subtree cost, which is basically the cost in SQL Server for that SQL statement. So in this example, um, obviously, this particular query qualified to be run in parallel. Um, and the degree of parallelism was four because uh, the customer must have set maxed off to four. And, um, and obviously, by, by logic, logical inference, their cost threshold was set to 117 or lower um, because the, the cost of this query is 117.304. So look for stuff like this in your execution plan to find out if that particular query ran in parallel or not. So again, you know, little little tips that'll help you um, debug whether that, that SQL can, it has qualified to be run in parallel or not, what to look for to see if it's been run in parallel or not and then make, um, make changes as needed um, to see if you can actually enable the query to run in parallel. Another um, option, and this works in SQL Server's management studio when I'm working with customers to tune SQL statements uh, that we have usually pulled either from the, the procedure cache in SQL Server or more likely from the AR Server API and SQL logs because in those logs you can find the actual SQL statement with literal values in place, especially for, for Remedy 9X and later. So the, the two, two uh, options I set before I even start tuning in that session are set statistics IO on and set statistics time on. And so um, once I do that, I actually have the DBA or the AR admin run that SQL. And when that SQL comes back with the rows on the bottom pane uh, window, there are two additional tabs. One of them is called messages. The other one is, and obviously when I'm running this SQL statement, I also have the DBA or the AR admin choose a little option up there called uh, actual execution plan. 
So there are two tabs that come down that show up in the, the window on the bottom next to the, the actual rows that are brought back. One of them is messages, the other one is the execution plan, actual execution plan. And the messages tab is the one that will have information about, uh, for example, the number of logical reads, the number of physical reads that the SQL statement wound up uh, experiencing when it ran, and uh, the time it took for that SQL statement to execute, elapsed time, CPU time. So there's a whole host of really good information. If you have physical reads in there, obviously your first, first activity would be to try and reduce the physical reads, um, maybe by um, you know, giving additional memory to SQL Server or you know, a whole host of other options, having it choose a different execution plan. Um, or, and then once that has been taken care of, if your logical reads are really high, uh, look into your execution plan and see if you can have it pick up a, a different index, a better index, or whatever the case may be. So, you know, you can you have really good information to start your tuning process. Question that I've been asked of late is, uh, how about schema binding and remedy? Does remedy support schema binding? So the answer is um, yes and no. What is schema binding? Um, Oracle does not have the feature where you can index a view, but SQL Server has that feature. You can create an index on a view. Um, uh, it does come with a caveat. The caveat is that when you create a view and you bind it to a table, it's a table that defines the view, the base table, the caveat is you cannot change the base table, you cannot drop a column, add a column without, uh, you will run into errors if you try to do that. So the only way to make that change, to drop a column or add a column, so basically a DDL change, would be to unbind the view, make the change, and then bind the view again. So for example, if, if you are applying a remedy hotfix or a patch or un, uh, performing an upgrade, and you have, because of you know um, performance gains, you bound one, one or one or more view to uh, a table or, or base tables. Your hotfix patch upgrade would generally would fail, and it might take a bit of time to try and debug why it's failing, both on your part and BMC support's part. So then you would have to unbind, so to speak, the view apply the hotfix patch, make sure it goes through, and then bind it again. So if you feel that you, BMC recommends you don't use this feature, schema binding, but if you do decide to do so, please be aware that you need to make sure you have a list of all the views that you have bound. And if you're about to apply a hotfix up, upgrade, perform an upgrade, unbind them. You know, make sure that activity finishes and then bind the views again. So that is something that you would have to do manually. But again, it comes with a caveat that you need to be aware that schema binding is not generally recommended by PMC because of the simple fact that you can't make any changes to tables that are associated with bound views. Now on to the other database, Oracle. So just like um, SQL Server has a configuration parameter called parameterization that enables SQL statements to be shared, if SQL statements have uh, literal values when they come into the database, Oracle's parameter is called cursor sharing. And uh, basically, as I mentioned before, Remedy 9x and higher, so 18x and 19x, uh, they've been written in Java and so we no longer send literal values like we were doing in version 8 and before. And we send variables, if we bind variable, literal values with variables in JDBC and we send that SQL already bound with variables to the database. So in Oracle, this is what BMC recommends, that if you're running your Oracle database or the ER admin um, schema in case sensitive mode, which is the default in Oracle, and we recommend you set your cursor sharing to exact for all Remedy 9.x versions. 
But if you're using case insensitivity and something that we are seeing more and more with our customer base of late, for remedy versions up to 9104, so 9103, 9102, 9101, 91, 90, we recommend you set that value to exact. And for 9104 and higher, we recommend you set that value to force if you're using Oracle case insensitivity. Now, uh, about three years ago, two and a half, three years ago, uh, one of the things one of our professional services uh, uh, consultants in Australia discovered this issue with Oracle. We had a large customer running Oracle, um, I think it was 11G back then, in case insensitive mode, and they were running into issues where SQL statements were not picking up uh, indexes, function-based indexes, also called linguistic indexes, and, um, and they were doing full table scans. And uh, basically, after doing some research, a consultant found that uh, it's, it's something that Oracle has addressed in a document ID. The document ID is 1451804. Basically, if you have a Oracle case insensitivity and you have the like operator and the SQL statement enters the database already bound with um, client generated bind variables instead of literal values. Oracle uh, is not going to be able to use indexes and it'll maybe end up uh, using a full table scan. And so the screen is showing you text from that document ID. I've pasted it from there, the relevant portions. And so basically what this, what this boils down to is the fact that if you are, as I said before in the previous slide, if you're running your cursor sharing, uh, if, you, if you are running 9104 or higher and you're running the database or the error admin schema in case insensitive mode, you would want to set your cursor sharing to exact because our SQL statements do have the like operator there. For example, when you are checking for role level security in ITSM, um, for example, we do have those four columns that we use, C112, C6, C0989, C60900901. So these columns have the like operator all over the place. So if you do not set this to force, you are likely to see full table scans. And uh, the reference section has um, basically a, a link to that document. I've put a public link as in something that's available to the general population out there. If you actually need that same information from Oracle support, you would likely need an Oracle support login ID. So I, I, the link I've put in there is available to everyone. You can see the gist of the document ID, the document, and you know make your decision about what this, um, what this I don't want to use go out on a limb and call it a defect or a bug, but what this problem addresses. Another parameter I've discovered over the years that seems to help, uh, that has helped with tuning SQL statements and having the SQL statement pick up an index or two or when it's not doing so, when it's kind of stubborn and recalcitrant and stubbornly refusing to budge from something like a full table scan, is this parameter called optimizer index cost ADJ, and the default value is 100. The closer you are to one, the more likely the optimizer is to pick up an index. So you're, you're telling the optimizer, look, I'm setting you this value set to one or to 10 or 15 or 20, whatever it is that you've decided to set it to, and I want you to look into an index and not choose a plan that has a full table scan. So you can set this at the session level if you're trying to do some tuning in SQL Plus or SQL Developer, or you can set it at the system level once you've made a choice after having tested this change of changed value in your non-production environment, thoroughly tested, mind you. And you can set it at the system level by issuing an alter system command, set optimizer, index cost, ADJ equal to some value, and then you would usually have an additional option there saying scope, scope equal to, and I usually choose both, both implying 
memory and SP file so that the next time your database is restarted, if that parameter is in your SP file, the server parameter file, it'll come up with that same value and, and that value will be in play when that database comes up. I have of late, well, not of late for the last eight, nine years, I've seen customer case uh, environments where the value has ranged from one to 50. And these are large customers, small customers, large customers too. So again, caveat, test it thoroughly, completely. Make sure your use cases don't degrade because the use case you're trying to tune might work much better, but other use cases might, might degrade and they might end up picking up a different plan that may not scale, that may um, eventually hurt them. So test these changes just, um, in for all your use cases thoroughly. Um, about three years ago, I was working with a customer in the Netherlands and they had this weird thing. For, the, for almost a week, they had this use case that used to go up and down. There were times during the day when that particular activity would run in half a second or, or six tenths of a second or a second. And there were other times in the day when it would take three seconds or four seconds or 10 seconds. And they actually spent two or three days coming up with you know, time or timing tables where they would send us tables with the use case and the different times in the day when they were running that and all the, you know, what they had experienced using a simple stopwatch. And, um, and eventually, you know, we were racking our brains. It was extremely frustrating what in God's name was going on. And so we actually even tracked it down to a single SQL statement that was kind of running erratically and it was the database administrator there who finally noticed in the execution plan that there was an additional note and this is on 12C, remember, um, they, were, they were some of the first, they were one of the first customers to move to 12C. And so he noticed that there was something called one, there was a SQL plan directive used for that particular SQL statement and I've highlighted in red on this uh, slide and for this example, which I also saw internally, because you know internally we have a lot of customer databases, and I noticed the same behavior for this one SQL statement, and this SQL statement is a truncated SQL statement. It comes from a real customer case, uh, use case, which I really, uh, which I wound up helping uh, tune later. Um, I noticed that the cost of the SQL statement was almost 8,000 megs, which is extremely high. And there was a SQL plan directive being used for the SQL statement. So I looked into the database um, and uh, this particular uh, SQL up there shows you what to look for. And uh, I found that there were four SQL plan, uh, plan directives for that particular table in question. And uh, basically I said, you know what, let me turn off these SQL plan directives and see what happens to the execution plan. So the command on the bottom of the screen, um, which basically grabs those four SQL uh, plan directive IDs um, in the middle of your screen in red, and I plug them into um, uh, an Oracle uh, procedure. Uh, I think it's dbms underscore spd for SQL plan directive and an alter SQL plan directive. I fed it the SQL plan directive ID and I set the enable flat to no. And uh, the minute I did that, uh, the execution plan looked a lot better. The cost went down to 756K and there was no longer um, a directive being used as you can see in this case. So if you find, your DBA finds that there, is, there are SQL plan directives that are adversely affecting your SQL statements and they're coming up with suboptimal plans that are affecting your use cases and resulting in really unhappy users. You may want to turn off that SQL plan directive. Again, test all of this thoroughly. You can do this at the database level by setting your optimizer adaptive features or configuration parameter to false. And basically what this does is it turns off all your 12 um, Oracle 12C adaptive features, which are very robust in 12C. Uh, and uh, that may be too wide an option. So I would recommend turning it off at SQL level. Once you have a SQL ID and you realize it's not running well, and there might be uh, one or more SQL directives that are affecting its execution and execution plan, um, you may want to turn off only at the SQL level and doing the exercise I did basically uh, you know, on the previous screen. 
So again, test it thoroughly to make sure use cases don't degrade or other use cases don't degrade. But I suspect they won't because you're doing it for the SQL uh, say statement, particular SQL statement. So hopefully it'll, it'll make that use case run better and you'll have happier users. Um, again, of late, I've, you know, we perform this exercise every so often um, on our larger tables. Uh, for example, help desk is the heart and soul of incident management in ITSM. And uh, base element and base relationship, especially base element, is the heart and soul of your CMDB and asset management. So one of the things that, oh, well, BMC, like any other application provider, ships out of the box indexes that hopefully end up uh, helping a huge majority of our customers. But then, you know, every most, more, every, pretty much every customer um, environment is customized, uh, leading to a lot of custom workflows, necessitating, necessitating um, custom indexes in the database. And so periodically, BMC does this internally. And um, you know, every few years, we take a look at indexes on base element, help desk, and other large tables, and uh, do an exercise in finding out you know, what indexes are effective? Can we add more indexes? Maybe in the last four years, we've found uh, some additional columns to index, and we usually put that out as knowledge base articles, but then also roll them back into the application uh, so that they can become out-of-the-box indexes. But then there are indexes that sometimes are not used at customer sites because they don't have those use cases being used. So you can monitor your indexes, uh, index usage by basically using a syntax that says alter index, name of the index, and monitoring usage. And uh, basically, if your, if your rep representative workload is, it goes, you know, it becomes representative over a week or two weeks so that most of your business use cases are covered in a week, let's say, or two weeks, I would recommend keeping your monitoring on for that period of time and then turning off that monitoring by altering the index and specifying no monitoring and then accessing these database objects, read our object usage of pre 12 c 12 and after 12 something called DBA object usage, and getting in, uh, statistics and getting information about indexes of when they were last used and how often. And then you can decide, make a judicious choice on which indexes to, to drop. Of course, with, again, the caveat that you want to keep the, the index definition somewhere so that in the future, if you do decide to reinstate that index, you can recreate them. So again, all of these caveats. Test these um, index, you know, drop your indexes, but test all of that um, in a non-production environment before rolling them into production. So performance aids, uh, loosely speaking, these are your tips. Um, Extremely large tables like base element or help desk um, may look into archiving or purging and making them skinnier, so to speak. That might help you. Um, logging turned on at the client here. Our customers use Fiddler logging, um, F12 in a Chrome browser to show you what uh, client generated calls, um, HTML, in HTTP request took time. Uh, turning on logging in the mid tier, you know, AR server API, SQL logs, all of these, um, uh, you know, you can use your API SQL logs and process them using the AR log analyzer, and it'll show you SQL statements that are running slowly, and the SQL statements will be the exact SQL statements with literal values in place, so they become really good candidates for tuning in SQL developer or, or SQL management studio. On Oracle, you know, AWR snapshot reports, ASH reports, you know, active session history reports, especially uh, generated during peak problem time windows. Execution plans, obviously, for SQL Server and for Oracle. And tuning that SQL and SQL Plus or SQL Developer. Um, if you have SQL IDs that you've identified as running poorly, SQL Health Check reports, SQL T reports, which are comprehensive reports for a, for a particular SQL ID that give you everything that happened ever since that SQL was born, its whole <laughs> life story. And so um, these are really powerful reports. On SQL Server, turning on SQL Profiler to show you SQL statements on activity in the database. That is, for example, 
um, the activities that are taking up a lot of resources, doing a lot of physical reads, or have uh, very high elapsed time. You can have ad hoc SQL, a lot of DBAs and SQL Server have their own um, you know, treasure chests of ad hoc SQL statements they employ to see what's going on in the database. Same thing with Oracle. Um, and um, of course, Oracle has um, Oracle Enterprise Manager, which is a really, really amazing graphical tool that lets you zero in on performance issues and identify SQL statements that are running poorly. So all of these tools basically are, are great aids in order to diagnose um, and uh, diagnose performance issues in your database. Um, just a sample SQL statement, identifying large AR tables and forms. So if you were to run this SQL, it would spit out the, the database table name, usually in, 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 or in, well, in, in Oracle or in SQL Server, our table names have T for table, H for history, and B for binary, because the B tables store the, the attachments you have usually for your incidents or for your ITSM, ITSM um, um, records. Um, the T table is the actual table. Uh, in this SQL, the B dot name is the AR name. And uh, the num rows, and uh, again, the SQL is for Oracle. Greater than 100,000 in this example, you could choose, change that number to whatever you like, 500,000, a million. And then the ADOT owner, in this case, is AR admin, which usually is the default for a lot of customer based uh, environments out there. And maybe the, this query can be run in order to identify tables that are, are really large in your database, and maybe you can look into archiving and, uh, or purging data from there. These are some of the references for stuff I've, I've talked about in the previous slides. The first one is basically the document ID I was talking about where Oracle is unable to pick up a good execution plan using indexes, linguistic indexes, and ends up uh, using full table scans if the SQL comes in pre-bound and has a like, uh, predic a like predicate check in there and you're using case insensitivity. And uh, tuning the uh, SQL Server database, uh, BMC's documentation about tuning that SQL Server database and the corresponding Oracle Server database. So in summary, today's uh, webinar covered basically tuning tips for SQL Server and for Oracle. Obviously, it was just kind of scratching the surface because there are other things I've done over the years. But um, these are the, some of the biggest things I've seen um, that help customers out there achieve uh, good, if not excellent, performance. And um, so I, I, I thought it was, it was right to share this information with you. And so if you go back and you now experiment with some of these things, I promise you um, they, these activities, these parameter changes, these you know, tips will help to a little extent for some of you and to a large extent for others. And um, BMC and uh, myself in particular, we're always here to help um, any time of the day or night. Uh, I would prefer day, but night is okay if that's all you can, uh, the only time you have. So um, please contact us if you need help. And I uh, thank you for attending today's webinar. Um, so it's good to share knowledge. Knowledge is greatest when it's shared. So thank you. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Patrick. Thank you all for giving me your time. Thank you. And I'll open Thanks, up Rajiv. for a question and ask. Oh. Great. Thank you, Rajiv, uh, for the presentation. And uh, now, Patrick, would you be able to uh, provide directions to our callers to signal for questions? Of course. If you'd like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. A voice prompt will let you know when your line is open. Please state your name before posing your question. Once again, press star 1 to ask a question. We'll take our first question. Caller, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Arne. Is it okay if I answer? Is it okay if I answer one of the questions I see in the chat? Yeah, we'll. Uh, I was going to raise that one verbally, Rajiv. So we'll just take the the caller on the line right now first. Okay. No worries. Hi, this is Aaron. I was um, I always had a question regarding the 
uh, CPU no greater than eight for the max parallelism. Um, so sure. if you have, let's say, 32, 32 uh, CPUs or some some number mm -hmm. larger than eight, it's better to set mm -hmm. it to zero than it is to set it to that actual number. Well, if you set it to zero, what's going to happen is is basically you will end up having SQL statements run on all 32 CPUs. Right. Now that uh, may not be something that. Again, it comes with the caveat that you may want to test all of this. And honestly, I would recommend uh, if you have uh, most most customers have support contracts with their database vendor. Um, if you have any doubts about what value to set uh, or need better advice, it's I always recommend and so does BMC get the database vendor involved. And I'll give you an example. Um, years ago, 2016, I was working with a large customer on the East Coast. Went there sat with the DBA, they had a 32-way CPU um, box and they had uh, 128 gig of RAM. They had capped SQL Server to 96 gig. Um, I worked with the DBA, they had set their max stop to one, which means they had turned up parallelism. Uh, they were having some use cases that were really slow in smart uh, reporting, smart IT. And so we looked at SQL statements. I had the DBA run that SQL statement with uh, in SQL Server Management Studio with uh, that a clause that says option max stop uh, and then the value. So I had a run with eight, six, eight, ten, and twelve, and uh, and uh, we found that eight and ten did not make a difference. So she was comfortable with running a value of eight, but they also got Microsoft involved, and Microsoft came back with a recommendation of ten, and they recommended that the customer increase their RAM from 128 to 256. So I would really recommend testing all this, also getting Microsoft involved if you have the time and the support contract allows you to do that. But setting it to zero might hurt you, uh, you but that's again, uh, it depends. So okay. hopefully I that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to kind of clarify why the recommendation was it. Okay, I understand, thank you. So if you set it to 16, you might find that it, it, may, not, it may not gain you anything at all. It might even maybe degrade. Hopefully not, but you get what I'm saying. So there has to be that sweet spot. And over the years, we found that the sweet spot lies around eight maximum. I got you. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for clarifying. Sure, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, we'll take our next question. Caller, please go ahead. Hello, this is Adam. I'd like to just ask uh, if it's possible to uh, to share the presentation slides because they contain a lot of very useful information. Thank you. Yes, Adam, uh, this is Greg. The slides will be provided as part of the recording and along with the Q&A and the links from the presentation, all this will be posted within a week of today's live presentation. Excellent, thank you very much. And. Uh, Thank you for a great presentation today. Thank you, Adam. Um, once again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star one. We'll take our next question. Please go. I ahead. do, I do, I do, I do, I do. If there's no caller, I do. Oh, there is. There is a caller on the line. Okay. Yeah, uh, my question is already asked. Thank you. I just wanted. Oh. Uh, who was that, by the way? So, so, sorry about that. Um, ah, my program is... No, 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 wait. Who, who was that last person? That voice sounded familiar. Uh, I'm trying to recall them. Unfortunately, I can't. Uh, caller, if you don't mind pressing sorry. star one again. I'm so sorry about Rajiv, that. Rajiv, if you want to uh, answer that question about the overview console from chat, you could go ahead at this time. Okay, so the question, the question that I wanted to answer is from David Pinto. So you, you folks can see my screen, right? Uh, no, we can't. Okay, not a problem. So, um, David, in answer to your question, that HPD Help Desk interface is one of the things I've encountered in the past uh, year, two years, where it's a join of HPD Help Desk to itself. And that join is on incident number. Uh, the column is C1000161. And so uh, I encountered this at a very, very large customer last year. And you are, you are right. One of the things 
that I discovered, um, and I proposed it to them. They were really happy because it did make a difference that SQL ran extremely quickly, uh, but that was not a choice they wanted to make. So here is my take on this. In your case, I, I re I'm reading your chat notes, and you're saying um, the solution for this issue has been to execute alter session set, optimize the features, enable to 11.204. What I actually discovered um, last year, was it earlier this year, it doesn't matter, is that that particular customer, and I suspect it's the case with you also, that you, your database version is 12.201 or higher. I discovered that if you set your optimizer features enable to 12.104, okay, 12.104, it's an anagram of 11.204, by the way. Even if you set it to 12.104, you will get the same execution plan, the good execution plan. But the minute you set it to 12.201, boom, that execution plan becomes a full table scan in one case. So it uses an index in one case and a full table scan in the other, if I remember right. So you could set it to 12.104 and, and get some of your, or most of your 12C adaptive optimizer features. Try that. This particular customer was uncomfortable setting it to a value other than the value that their database was on, which is 12201. So they engaged Oracle support, and Oracle support actually gave them a fixed, a fixed control parameter to be set in their SP file. And, uh, and uh, I won't take up too much time, but that so the parameter is an underscore parameter. It's a hidden para it's a, Sorry, it's an underscore parameter. It's underscore fix, underscore control. And what this parameter does is when it's on, when it, the value is on, as in on-off in, 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 inside the database for Oracle are 0 and 1. So if it's on, that's fixed for a particular bug will be executed, the code path will be executed. When, it, when you set it off, that fix, that code path will not be executed. So in the case of this customer, the fixed control for that particular bug, so the value of fixed control is bug number, colon, zero or one, turning it on or off. So for that particular customer, they set it to off. They turned off a fix for that bug to off, and that helps them with that particular SQL statement. So again, you might look into even a fixed control for a specific SQL statement, because that SQL statement or SQL statements might be, in your case, uh, running poorly because of a, a, a bug fix. So maybe, uh, and if you send an email offline um, to me or to Greg or someone, I'd be more than happy to answer and talk about more about the fixed control. So there was a question about the overview console. That was it. Uh, that was the one in regards from David. It was related to the overview console. Ah, okay. Uh, Rajiv, I have another question uh, that I have sure. uh, that came in. It, uh, it says, ITSM ships with many indexes. Since we may end up adding some of our own indexes, would it be wise to delete any of the out-of-the-box indexes that we are not using? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so please monitor. Please keep tabs on these indexes. Hopefully, if you do it for a long enough time that represents your business workload, uh, look, go back and then take a look um, at these indexes and uh, and decide uh, whether you want to drop them or not. Uh, I would recommend keeping those index structures somewhere so that in case you decide to reinstate them, you would be able to do so. But drop them. Uh, again, if you have a good enough non-production environment that represents production in terms of data volumes, physical hardware, not always necessary the number of users unless you have virtual users that you have modeled and use your own um, environment and your business use cases using tools like Load Runner or Segway Silk or any of these uh, tools. Uh, if you have a representative vir uh, virtual user workload, nothing like it. Run that, 
test your changes and make sure uh, you know use cases don't suffer. But yeah, um, I would recommend doing that. I, I have a very large customers who who have consulted with me about indexes. And my answer is, if you're reasonably confident, if you're confident that these indexes are definitely not being used and you want to drop them, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another one. Um, if I have a replicated SQL Server DB used for reporting, is it possible that increasing the MDOP or uh, setting it to zero and decreasing the cost threshold would help? Is there any risk of doing that for a reporting DB? Well, if the reporting DB is separate from your, your production DB, which is what we always insist on, you do not want reporting activity to take away from uh, uh, resources from your user base that's actually creating incidents, modifying incidents, or, or other stuff. Um, again, it comes with, uh, with uh, you know, knowing your workload, looking into the database, profiling your, your reports that are running and the activity in the database, and then experimenting. So experiment, you know. Remember, reducing the cost Will, will make more SQLs eligible to be run in, in parallel. So obviously, you have to find that sweet spot between MDOP and, or max, MDOP and uh, the cost. Okay, uh, one other question is, if we have a very large table, what is BMC's recommendation? Do we need to try to keep sizes of the tables capped to some level? I think this is uh, around maybe archiving uh, data so it doesn't grow too large. Again, it depends on how big your table is, what, what is happening in that table, are you seeing um, slow inserts, you know, all of this stuff goes back to um, DBA related activities. It's, we, as, as your application provider, we never have direct access to any customer database. Anything that needs to be done has to be done with the DBA's help. So yes, I would recommend keeping tabs on your large tables, especially the hot tables, and, um, and, and deciding whether you want to archive, purge, you know, there are so many options out there. Uh, Oracle has lots of great features. You know, maybe you may not need to, you could, access tables, you know, partition your tables and create parti partitioned indexes. There's so many different options, especially on Oracle. So on the whole, we do recommend archiving and purging. Um, if, you, if you do not need that data, um, archiving, if you really need it, um, you know, maybe archive it on tape or on a separate set of disks or whatever, you know, you, you need to do. And, uh, and see if uh, making the tables skinnier helps you. Perfect, thank you. Um, Patrick, are there any other uh, queued up questions for us? Yes, there is one question. Caller, please go ahead. Hi, this is Ajit. Uh, I have a question here. We have a dedicated AI server for smart reporting, but the underlying AI system is read-only. So are these setting, uh, settings applicable for read-only database as well? Uh, which settings? Um, you mean the Mac? Database Mac tuning settings we discussed, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, The sure. SQL yeah, server yeah. settings. Yeah, yeah. So, so okay. here's the deal. Um, it's so if it's a read-only database, you're going to have select statements, correct? Yeah. Because you're, you're using it for smart reporting, right? Right. Exactly. So, so it's, it's a SQL, whether it's select, insert, delete, you know, whatever it is. It's a SQL statement. So in, in your read-only database, you'll have all kinds of select statements running, pulling data, reporting, and... Um, all of these will surely apply. It's a SQL statement. All SQL statements have a cost associated with them. So yes, it'll apply okay, especially right. in your read on database. So again, play around with those values and especially the cost. And each SQL statement has a cost and uh, 
And so in, in, in your, you know, is, uh, is this Oracle or SQL Server that you're talking about? Uh, SQL Server. SQL Server. Correct. Correct. So you're familiar with the execution plan, on, you know, the cost yeah. of the query, you know, how to find out whether it's running in parallel or not. Okay, great. Yeah, that, that answers my question. Thank you. Yeah, please do. It's, it's a great feature. We've had pretty much all customer sites benefit a lot from these two, running queries in parallel. It's a great option. You can do the same on Oracle. It's not as easy to do. I mean, you can, but both databases will benefit more often than not. Uh, it appears there are no further questions over the phone lines now. I guess last call for questions, star one. Okay, I'll turn over the call back over to uh, Greg for any additional or closing comments. Great, thank you. Uh, and thanks everyone for uh, joining uh, today's webinar. I'll just go through uh, our self-help and contacting BMC again this uh Live webinar will be posted on our YouTube channel. All the Q&A and presentation links will be available uh, on the communities page uh, at this link. And also we do have the product support pages that are available that blend uh, knowledge, documents, as well as uh, videos for you to uh, find based on the different product uh, components. Uh, you can contact technical support via web phone and email, as well as via the social uh, outlets as well. Again, wanted to thank you all for joining this week's uh, presentation. Thank you to Rajiv and all the panelists as well. Uh, that concludes Thanks, this session.